Hi, my name is Tyler Reed, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of risk tolerance. I'm going to give you a presentation on five of the ten factors that exist. So when we think of risk tolerance, how are we going to understand what risk tolerance is in the workplace? Risk tolerance involves weighing a number of factors that influence a decision to either accept or reduce risk. How these factors are perceived and weighed in the mind of the worker in the work group affects safety behavior at the individual level and at a group behavior. So whenever you look at influencing risk tolerance, is taking a risk a conscious decision? And what factors influence our decisions to take risk? Do we understand why we make the decisions we do? And how can we influence choices? How can we influence the choices we make to better reject risk in the workplace? And of course, what is the relationship between hazard recognition, risk perception, and risk tolerance? So we'll start with some definitions. What is a hazard in the workplace? It's a condition or situation that could create an incident. And what is perception? So how do we perceive this hazard? It is a process to add meaning to re received information influenced by our knowledge and experience of work or training that we've had. And what is risk perception? It's our subjective judgment we make about the characters, characteristics and severity of risk. Specifically, what could go wrong and how bad could it be? So what is our focus of our pr presentation is risk tolerance. So what is risk tolerance? It's the amount of risk that an individual or group is willing to accept in the pursuit of some goal. Behavior is determined by more of what we perceive than the actual risk. So if you look at risk perception and you try to model it, and you look at a hazard identification, in the workplace, companies are, do really well at hazard identification. They have JSAs, they have safety walkthroughs, all which identify the hazards. So they're well documented. The thing that a company may not do as well as is do they actually perceive the hazard and understand it completely. So a mature safety culture will usually be functional on this topic, but some um, people may need more help in certain areas, maybe looking at past incidents and actually seeing what has led to some of the events that have happened. And then of course the last part of our model is risk tolerance. This is where we accept or reject the risk and this is going to be based on all of our experiences and training throughout our life and how we actually perceive the actual hazard. So if we look at layers of protection, you know you, we usually look at training procedures and our hazard recognition tools that companies do really well on. But what we've done is we came up with 10 factors that will influence risk, and it's compared to the Swiss cheese model. You know, we're, we're trying to close all the gaps and keep all of our barriers moving to prevent the hazards from getting through. So the 10 factors include overestimating capability or experience, familiarity with the task, seriousness of the outcome, voluntary actions and being in control, personal experience with the outcome, cost of noncompliance, confidence in the equipment that we work around, confidence in protection and rescue, potential profit and gain from actions, and role models accepting risk. Today I'm going to start speaking to you about the first five. So the first factor is overestimating capability. People tend to overestimate the value of their experience and capabilities and underestimate the associated risk. So basically throughout their work time, you know, they've become subject experts on what they're doing and they feel that they can complete a task without having risk involved. So some of the things that this might include is maybe shortcutting an actual procedure in pursuit of saving time or saving money for the company. Or maybe it's just physical ability. You know, I've lifted heavier before. I can lift this nitrogen bottle from the corner and take it to the other side of the room without a problem. You know, and things in the personal life you might hear is I've driven longer or I've driven in worse conditions and nothing's happened before. So what are some of the strategies that we can do in the workplace to influence people to take less risk? Let's stop and think is what is the best way we can do this task? This is a tool that I used in my presentation that I developed and this really just brings you back down to what's the correct procedure, am I doing it the preferred method, and then am I also following the company guidelines? And then of course you can reflect on your role as a mentor. Am I setting a good example for everybody else in the work field? The second factor is familiarity with the task and this deals directly with complacency. If you don't understand complacency you won't understand this factor. So I'll start with the definition of complacency and it's self-satisfaction especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. And complacency usually is due to two factors that I came up with. And it's just being so familiar with the task that it's repetitive. Um, you might do that task for long durations and you get comfortable working near a hazard. Also, you might become skeptical of the potential hazard because you've done it so many times that nothing has occurred in the past. This is what you'll usually hear in the workplace, is I've climbed this ladder every day for five years and nothing has happened. Well, you know what? It's the fifth year and first day of the year that the incident occurs and there's an, a, a, an injury. So how can we influence people to not 
shortcut procedures and not use all their experience to base their decisions on. So we can start off with some of the strategies as verbalizing a task while they're doing it. Maintain situational awareness and then of course treat every time like it's the first time. People are now you know, subject experts on what they're doing, but if they treat it like the first time, they're more likely to follow the correct procedures and look at company guidelines. And of course, what could go wrong this time? Maybe there's a new employee, or maybe there's new equipment involved. Which brings me to my third factor, which is serious of the outcome. This factor deals directly with when we believe that the outcome of our actions will not be serious, we are prepared to take more risk. And part of this is due to what the companies have been doing in the past. So let's look at some of the labeling. On equipment, we, we often see pinch point, or we might see hot water. But really what's going to happen whenever we put our finger in a pinch point? It's really going to be a crush point or an amputation point. So on the company level, we need to address these hazards as what they really are. We don't need to involve shock and horror, but really, whenever we think about serious of the outcome, the individual may not be realizing how bad it could be if they do something wrong. And they may not be taking into consideration, you know, people around them, what their task or how their task could involve other people. So what are some of the strategies we can do here? And this is just using the proper language whenever we're labeling hazards. Like I said, pinch point is a crush point. Hot water is not hot water. It's not, ba it's not for a bathtub. This is scalding steam water that will cause severe burns. And then also we can use our incident communications and our safety alerts in the workplace to make sure that when an incident does occur, we're sharing how bad, it is, how bad an accident could really be. Trains are my fourth factor, which actually does not involve being in the workplace, but also what we do off of work. Because we, we need every individual to be well prepared and hopefully 100% healthy when they come to work. When we look at volunteer actions and being in control, this is the risk of an activity is viewed as less risk when we engage in it voluntarily or we feel we have complete control of the activity. So basically it comes down to the desire and us feeling that we're in control. So when we have the desire to maybe pursue this activity because maybe we get a short adrenaline rush and we just say, hey, you know what, the risks are okay because I'm going to get this great adrenaline rush or you know what, I'm in control, I'm driving, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, there is no risk involved in this. So whenever we look at the desire and if we feel that we're in control, we perceive the risk as being lower. But in fact, 9 of the 10 employees are killed off work, 66% of the disabling injuries occur after work, and 1,000 or 1,000 times more likely to accept risk if it is voluntary versus involuntary. This information all will be found on the National Safety Council. So what can we do? So we can go back and use that tool that I developed. It's the use stop and think process for voluntary activities. The simple questions, you know, how bad could this be? Am I following the right procedure? May save you from doing something that you may not have recognized if you wouldn't have used the card. And then, of course, you can ask these questions to the group. It doesn't have to be on an individual level. It can also be the group, and they're more likely to find a risk that you may not have identified beforehand. To bring me to my fifth factor, which is a strong one, I believe, it's personal experience with an outcome. And the, the basis is, if you have a serious outcome, you'll be less tolerant of the risk in the future, and so will the people that are involved. So for me personally, when I grew up, I, ra I raced motocross for 10 years. But after I broke my femur, I realized how bad it could be if I made a mistake on my motorcycle, and I got to spend two weeks in the hospital, I was less likely to accept risk. So what can we do in the workplace to you know, share these personal experiences and make people take less risk? And that's keeping the corporate memory alive and demonstrate that the incidents have occurred because people will become skeptical as incident rates improve. You know, Our goal is to nobody gets hurt, but with, with that comes with um, skepticism of if people are really getting hurt. So we need to keep the corporate memory alive and share our incidents. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and comments, and you can feel free to contact me. You can e either email me at trreed at okstick.edu, or you're welcome to call me at 405-334-3449. Thanks, guys.